Um, so let me introduce myself first real quick. Uh, I'm, I'm Jeremy, I work on the machine learning platform team at Netflix, but this is my own talk, I'm not here on behalf of Netflix. Um, you can link me in, I'm Gentleman and a Scala on LinkedIn. I'm Jeremy R. Smith on GitHub, and I have Twitter at the same name, I don't really use it though, other than for complaining. Um, so uh, if I look a little bit familiar, you might have seen me here back in 2019, I was one floor up talking about Polynote, which is a Scala first uh, polyglot notebook tool that I made. Uh, I'm not talking about Polynote today, this is gonna be the conference's uh, obligatory talk about technical debt instead, which is a really exciting talk, topic I know. So why am I giving this talk instead of talking about like plugging some OSS project or talking about some school, cool Scala thing? Um, and the reason is it's just, it's been on my mind a little bit. Uh, I found it useful to organize my thoughts about it, and so uh, the goal here is to maybe encourage you to organize your thoughts about it. Uh, and if uh, things that I'm saying are obvious or obviously wrong, then that's great. It means that you are thinking about it, uh, and that's kind of the, the point here. Um, and kind of the motivation is uh, most of us don't really think about what we are going to be doing you know, five, ten years down the road, let alone what's, what our code is going to be doing. Uh, so, you know, I think just making a plan for that, kind of like a, a, a you know, five-year plan for your code, like you would for yourself, uh, can be an interesting exercise. But why, why am I giving this talk specifically? Um, like, what qualifies me to talk about this kind of thing? Uh, and the reason is, uh, well, let me get a show of hands. Who's ever had to clean up somebody else's mess? Yeah. And who, who's ever had to clean up your own mess? Okay, good, a lot of people. Um, but you know, I, I noticed, uh, particularly in Silicon Valley, um, it can be common to kind of, you know, by the time your code starts causing problems, you're at a different company, uh, so it, it, it's not really your problem. Um, but you know, it's kind of unusual. I spent 10 years at a company. I've been at Netflix now for almost seven years. Um, so it's kind of long tenures, and I've uh, been, er been around long enough to make mistakes and live to regret them at, at multiple companies. So um, yeah, that's, that's kind of where I'm coming from. Uh, all right, so, so this is a super scientific plot that I borrowed from Robert Martin of, you know, a, a typical software project's uh, productivity measurement over time. And it starts off really great, uh, it's exciting, we're whiteboarding, we're architecting, uh, everybody's uh, making amazing, elegant abstractions and cranking out features right and left. Um, but over time, and the, the time axis is not to scale here, obviously, over time it, it, it can start to dwindle, like productivity just sort of starts to slow down, features take longer to build, um, you know, progress just doesn't happen as fast. And one reason that happens is technical debt. And I'm gonna define this as anything that should be changed but hasn't been changed yet. Uh, I, I coincidentally heard another talk recently about tech debt and they used the, the, the phrase like the delta between the current state and the ideal state of the code, which I think is a lot more eloquent way of putting it, but I'm gonna stick with mine because uh, that would be cheating to steal theirs. Um, so uh, what we usually think of when we think of technical debt is the self-inflicted technical debt. And this is kind of the stuff that we uh, inflict on ourselves and our colleagues or our uh, successors potentially uh, for the sake of deliverables, right? And this is things like to-dos, we'll do, we'll, uh, we'll do this thing later. You know, I know I need to do this, but I'll do it later. Um, I'm gonna do a quick and dirty thing right now just to, you know, hit that deadline. I'm going to do a hack or a workaround that I know is, you know, probably not the best way to do it, but I don't really have time right now to figure out what the best way is, and this is gonna work, so that's what I'm gonna do. And I'll come back and fix it later, right? Uh, how often does that happen? Uh, we'll talk about that. Um, but then there's, there's tech debt, that's what I would just call age-related tech debt. And this comes largely from things outside the project. Uh, and this is things like concept drift, right? So when, uh, you know, maybe the software has to do something slightly different now than it did before, uh, or new features have come into into the into uh, consideration, and 
and that makes it so our abstractions are leaky now and we need to go reevaluate what they actually should be. Um, so things like that. Um, obsolescence, maybe there's now, there, we implemented a bunch of algorithms, but those are old hat, now there's brand new fancy way of doing, doing those same things and, and we need to go uh, implement those new ways of doing it. Um, and dependencies are a big one, right? We, we depend on uh, libraries, on, on languages, platforms, uh, and when those things change, we need to do migrations. We need to update our dependencies. We need to move on to new platforms. Um, you know, we need to change from Python 2 to Python 3 or Scala 2 to Scala 3. Uh, and putting those things off because they're slow and expensive and, and not a lot of fun uh, is a form of tech debt. And, and so you might ask yourself, what, what constitutes finished software? And uh, I'd argue like there's almost no such thing really as finished software because ev all software accumulates that tech debt just by existing, um, just by the passage of time, right? Existing through the passage of time, a project is gonna keep accumulating tech debt. Uh, even with nobody touching it, right? Let's say we call it done and we walk away. Uh, you know, years later, that project's got tech debt. If anybody goes to change it, they're gonna have a lot to deal with, right? Um, and, and this comes from Security vulnerabilities, you know, maybe you introduced one in your code or maybe one of your dependencies or your platform or your framework has a security vulnerability and then when they fix that, you've got some tech debt because you've got to migrate. Um, incompatibility, so uh, uh, as libraries evolve, uh, your dependencies might start conflicting with each other. You know, we call this dependency hell. Um, if you don't migrate your language, you won't be able to update your platform because the new OS doesn't have the old uh, Python or whatever. Um, so these things accumulate. Uh, and worst of all, hindsight accumulates. So software is made by people. Uh, people hopefully grow and change over time. So, uh, and the world changes around you as well. So things that seemed like a good idea at the time can become huge mistakes retroactively, right? And that's a form of tech debt as well. Um, and these things tend to compound with each other multiplicati multiplicatively, um, just like debt. So what's the cost of keeping tech debt around? It's like, what's the interest you pay to, to use a weak, the weak debt analogy? Um, there's some direct costs of this, right? There's uh, lost productivity, like we saw in that scientific plot at the beginning. Um, tech debt tends to slow you down in various ways. Uh, there's lost agility, meaning that uh, the, the needs of the software changes or the market changes, your users change, and you can't uh, adapt quickly to that uh, because of tech debt slowing you down. Um, and of course, there's costly failures that can come out of failing to maintain uh, the software. This is just a couple of examples that might look familiar of uh, you know, cases where old, outdated, tech debt-ridden software that nobody had time to update caused a lot of financial, you know, economic cost. There's also indirect costs, though, uh, of tech debt. Uh, software doesn't exist in a vacuum. Uh, all software has users, and a lot of software is used by other software in turn. So if you're working on libraries or frameworks or platforms, um, your software has, your software project has other software projects that depend on it. Um, and this creates network effects when it comes to tech debt. And I think the, the indirect costs are the more interesting part to me because I think it's the part that we don't think about as much. Um, and even if we think about it, we might not think about the scale uh, of it. And we'll talk more about that later. Um, but the point here is a project's tech debt is also borne by all the other projects that depend on that project, right? Even transitively. So if you have tech debt in your project, anybody that's using your software as a dependency also has some tech debt uh, from that in their own project. Um, yeah, so tech debt kind of begets downstream tech debt. And that can come from like code problems with your code, uh, maybe bugs that are, that are uh, introduced by you know, failing to maintain it properly. 
um, leaky abstractions, uh, incomplete features that leave people having to do workarounds because your software doesn't do everything that it needs to do, um, uh, awkward APIs that leave people's code looking messy or things like dependency hell. So paying it off, there's uh, a few strategies I'm gonna talk about for dealing with tech debt. Uh, and I'll do another show of hands here. Who has seen like a to-do or fix me or something like that in their code in recent memory? In any code in their company? Okay, great. Uh, keep your hand up, keep your hand up. Now keep your hand up if and only if you fixed it. Be honest, okay. All right, I see a couple hands up, that's good. But a lot of them went down. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not here to judge, I think that's, uh, ignore it is a very uh, popular strategy for dealing with tech debt. Uh, it's like kick the can down the road, it's like an interest only loan, for example, um, and uh, you know, that, that can be tempting because uh, it requires no work right now. Um, and we're all very busy. Um, so make payments, uh, is what I would say, like incrementally chip away at the to-dos. Um, we can migrate things that need mi migrating. We can, you know, be diligent like some of you who see a to-do and you fix it right there, that's great. Um, but that can be tricky to do. It can be tricky to find time for that. Um, there's also like, you could think of like larger lump sum payments. Maybe we'll take a week and everybody's gonna work on, te you know, tech debt related stuff for a week. Um, that, that, that happens as well. Um, but, you know, it, it can be, it can be tough to, uh, to find time for any of that. Um, and then there's uh, the, the rewrite, right? Uh, like declaring ba bankruptcy sort of, but with, with less paperwork. Um, and this is a popular one too, because you know, knowing what we know now, this will be easy. We can start from scratch, uh, tech debt free, clean slate, green field. Uh, it'll be fun, it'll be easy. Um, so that can be very attractive. Um, so, one, so a couple of reasons I think uh, making payments uh, can be a tricky proposition. Um, and I, this is kind of like the, the treadmill, but it, it takes a huge amount of discipline to incorporate this into your daily practice, which is probably the most uh, effective way of dealing with it. Uh, so if you have that discipline, that's great. Um, a lot of us, you know, struggle with that. Uh, and there's, there, you know, it's understandable. Um, and Tech debt can also accumulate faster than you can pay it off in, uh, with that strategy. Right, uh, uh, you're not the only one on your team. Maybe your colleagues uh, are adding workarounds and, and hacks and things. Maybe uh, your dependencies are evolving more quickly than you can keep up with. Um, but it can accumulate too fast to be able to pay it off that way. And it can be hard to justify those larger uh, chunks, right? We're going to take two weeks to work on tech debt. Um, you know, maybe you tell your manager, we're going to spend two weeks of resources to keep things exactly the same. That can be a, a tough sell um, uh, in, at some companies. Uh, and then on, on the extreme opposite end of ignoring it, there's, the, there's rewriting it. So it can be really, really tempting to say, hey, let's just start over. Uh, because that, that can be a lot of fun. It's really tempting for engineers to, to have a green field, to have a clean slate, um, because we can recapture that feeling of being very productive, right? Remember the graph at the beginning, when we first start a project, we're super productive and it feels great. Um, and we can do it right this time, we can do it modern. You know, we'll make it, we'll make, we'll make it much better this time around. Uh, but something to keep in mind is for a project that's been around for a while, it's accumulated a lot of functionality, presumably, uh, and we can, we can, we tend to underestimate how much functionality uh, is there and how much we'll have to uh, rewrite in order to, to make this work. So how much work and effort, how much time is it gonna take to reach feature parity in your rewrite? Um, it can be easy to underestimate that. Uh, and we can also, fail to think about like what's gonna stop tech debt from creeping in this time. You know, uh, it happened before, what, why, isn't gonna, why won't it happen this time? Uh, even if we do get to you know, reclaim that productivity bump from the Greenfield project, uh, how are we gonna keep tech debt accumulation at bay this time around? And not, not to mention, while we're rewriting, 
the, the system, what's going to happen in the meantime? So we have an existing software that everybody's using. We're, we're telling them, you know, we're going to stop working on that. Uh, it's not going to evolve anymore while we take, you know, however long, months, years, to, to rewrite the whole thing from scratch, um, adding no new functionality at the end of that. So that can be a difficult sell for, for your users. Um, and we also can't assume, on the other side of it, maybe we can't assume that the existing thing is going to remain stagnant while we, while we rewrite it. So uh, a, a lot of times uh, the rewrite uh, arose by some new feature that nobody wants to implement in the old system, or it's too hard to do it because of all the tech debt. Um, and so is that new feature just going to be on the table while we rewrite the whole thing? Or, uh, you know, what's, what's likely to happen is somebody has to go in and implement that new feature anyway in the old system while we're doing the rewrite. And now what motivation does anybody have to adopt uh, the rewritten thing afterwards? Because um, that's, that's going to be a migration for them, right? Uh, so, you know, just, uh, you know, a rewrite can be successful with uh, a lot of discipline and uh, a lot of talented engineers. Um, and a lot of mandate from management. Uh, but make sure you have a plan for that. Make sure you have a plan for uh, there being a real, realistic path to adoption of, of the new system and motivation uh, for users and look at it from, from users' perspective. Um, and so uh, here's kind of a, uh, one way to think about whether, like, whether or not a rewrite makes sense. Um, you could think of it like, we're, the, the project is sailing to a destination, and maybe we've drifted a little off course, right? Uh, so there's the place that we want to be, and there's the place that we are now. Uh, and if you think of these as sort of points in some ocean of, of space, then uh, you know, think about how far we've come. Uh, I guess in this analogy, you also have to imagine that you're able to teleport yourself back to, the, back to zero instantly, but not teleport anywhere else. So it's kind of a, a leaky uh, analogy. But, you know, if, if the distance between the current state and the target state is less than the distance between zero and the target state, um, you know, the target state being defined by some measurement, you know, hopefully it's a, a business-oriented measurement and not, you know, a developer satisfaction measurement. Um, but, you know, you'll get different uh, different ideas here based on what, what criteria you use there. Um, but that can be a useful way of thinking about it. Uh, so what's the total cost of paying off tech debt? So there's a direct cost, um, which is you know, just the engineering resources of whatever strategy we chose, whether it's incrementally paying it off, whether it's rewriting or ignoring. Um, there's that direct cost. Uh, and there's like an opportunity cost of doing that instead of doing something else. You know, you could be uh, devoting your resources to adding new features to the existing thing instead of paying off tech debt. So what aren't you doing in order to, to work on tech debt? But there's also like an indirect cost, which is a cost that's like not borne directly by your organization. Uh, and I think that's why we don't think about the indirect cost as much. Um, but what happens is something like this. This is a famous uh, XKCD comic. So uh, this person's fixed some tech debt in their software, uh, and that's broken somebody else downstream who has been using it in a horrifying way, uh, which happens frequently, right? So, and it's true, every change, like any time you change software that has downstream users, uh, it's going to break somebody. Uh, when a project pays off tech debt, it creates tech, tech debt in downstream projects, right? Um, and like we were talking about before, this can have network effects. So if a project updates its APIs, uh, like say you're Zio and uh, you're thinking, oh, we, you know, instead of naming this method for each underscore, we should have named it for each discard. Um, and maybe that's true, you, you should have done that, but uh, if you change it now, a lot of people have to migrate to that new thing, right? Uh, so that's tech debt for them. So, uh, you know, and if, uh, if you update your dependencies in your project, 
that will create tech debt for you uh, or for uh, people downstream of you um, based on that. And so the, the network effects kind of cause a lose-lose here, right? We were saying before, if you don't pay off tech debt, it creates tech debt downstream. Uh, and if you do pay off tech debt, it creates tech debt downstream. Um, and I think we, we sort of, we tend to underestimate the scale of network effects. Um, and this is, this is actually an illustration of uh, a graph in hyperbolic space, but I like the exponential uh, nature of it. Um, like, you, you'll see somebody making a decision based on, you know, what it costs us directly, like what, what, what's the development speed, for example, of making this decision. Um, but if you think about the work that it's going to create downstream and downstream of that and downstream of that, uh, the total cost can can be a lot more than than what's obvious just by thinking about you know the local cost. Uh, so I guess the point is to weigh the total economic benefit of the the changes you're making or the the tech debt you're paying off versus the total cost of what that's going to be uh, taking all the you know all the network effects into account. Um, so so if we're going to get tech debt no matter what. Uh, paying off tech debt is going to create tech debt. Not paying off tech debt is going to create tech debt downstream. Um, does that mean everything's hopeless? Uh, I think it's not hopeless uh, because even if you can't eliminate this problem, you, you can minimize it uh, by being mindful uh, of the tech debt that you're going to create. So some, so some points here are compatibility is key, right? If you support your APIs, uh, if you have stable APIs or stable ABIs, and this is like, you know, in, in JVM land, this is binary compatibility, uh, then that can truncate the network effects of, of, uh, of this paying off tech debt, of creating tech debt. Um, so I, I like a shout out to CATS here, is I wanna make a shout out to CATS, they, they've had forward uh, I mean, they've had backward binary compatibility for years in CATS. Uh, that's not easy to do. Even through API changes, they've, they've managed to keep binary compatibility. And uh, that's why CATS doesn't really contribute to dependency hell as much as other libraries do. Um, it's because of that, the, that commitment. And that can be huge. It's not a magic bullet. Uh, backward compatibility is not the whole story. Uh, for example, if you have uh, frameworks or platforms that distribute some, you know, binaries with it, like say Spark, for example. Uh, you know, if they're using an old version and there's no forward compatibility, then people who are using new versions can can have uh, uh, conflicts as well. So it's not a magic bullet, but it's a, it makes a huge, huge difference. Uh, and Scala 3 has this target name annotation. Uh, this is one tool for intentionally keeping binary compatibility. Um, it's, it's not even the intended purpose of that annotation, but it could be used for that. I would love to see a lot more uh, features, you know, in the lang in languages uh, that are dedicated to being able to evolve while keeping compatibility. Um, I think that would make a, a huge difference. Like if I could say this method is no longer usable from source, but it is going to be there in the binary, uh, just so you know people who are using an old version of the ABI can, can, uh, can still upgrade or use a, uh, a new version. Like, that would be huge. Uh, and sac sacrifice things at the altar of stability. So the, the JVM platform itself is a great example here. Uh, it's evolved over the years, um, but it's evolved like very slowly and intentionally and thoughtfully um, and you can see the thought that they put into it. You can take t code that you compiled, you can take Java that was compiled in 1997 and run it on today's uh, JVM. And that's, uh, you know, not easy to pull that kind of thing off while still uh, making progress on your platform. But uh, they sacrifice, you know, speed at the altar of stability, and that's one reason why it's such a successful platform, I think. Um, all right, I want to say one thing about migration tools. 
So uh, Scholafix is a, uh, a tool for automatic rewriting, and that's awesome. It's really great, can be very helpful uh, when you have to do uh, uh, migrations. But when you are evolving your software, if you don't want to create tech debt downstream, or you want to minimize tech debt downstream, pretend Scholafix doesn't exist. And the reason I say this is, uh, don't, like, don't make assumptions that your users have Scholafix or will be able to, to use it, uh, or it will work perfectly for them. And I see a lot of uh, a lot of sentiment lately, like rewrite tools will take care of it. You know, and this becomes sort of a, a magic mantra, sort of uh, akin to, oh, the hotspot will optimize that away. You know, and people like repeat that to themselves without really thinking about whether it's true. And a lot of times, it's not true. Um, and it can be like changes that are made on the basis of it's okay because rewrite tools will fix it. Th those can be dangerous because it's an excuse to avoid intentionality in the changes that you make. Um, and that kind of worries me. Like I've seen this especially with uh, with regard to the evolution of the Scala language itself. There's a lot of sentiment of well, we can just make you know large sweeping changes willy-nilly because rewrite tools will, will solve it for everybody. And I think uh, it's, we're going to reach a point where that, it becomes clear that that's not always true. Um, and that's, that worries me because I really like Scala. I want it to succeed, and I think uh, stability is, is pretty essential to, to the success of, a, of an ecosystem. Uh, and one example I want to give is, is Scala test. If you work on Scala test, I really appreciate you. Uh, this is not, I'm going to try to pick on Scala test. But it's a recent uh, example that sticks out to me, which is they, so Scala test is a uh, testing tool for, for Scala. Uh, most of you, if you've used Scala, you've probably encountered it. Um, and they, you know, they had some tech debt. They wanted to introduce the ability for tests to return typed values or use typed values. Um, and they hadn't had that before. So how do you move from, you know, the, where we are now to, to having that. I assume that there was, you know, two choices that they could have made. I wasn't there, so I'm not sure, but uh, it seems likely that they were thinking of, well, we could start a whole new hierarchy that has the types in there, and then people could move to that as they, as they please. Um, or we could stick the type thing in the hierarchy and make the current thing, you know, just a special case of that. Uh, and that required them to, re like, Anybody who didn't want to opt into the types uh, would have to change their, like all of their tests, uh, you know, to to do that migration. And I, I suspect that they chose the latter uh, on the back of Scholafix because they did offer Scholafixes uh, to help with that. Uh, but those Scholafixes don't work perfectly. Uh, and uh, this is just anecdotal, but I know from from my personal experience, like I spent at least a week on migrating tests to the new Scala test. And that's not, you know, something that felt particularly productive. Um, so I, that, like that, if they had thought about the network effects a little more, if they had, you know, thought about what do we do in the absence of Scala fix, um, I think they might have made that decision differently. Um, so yeah, definitely use it and definitely provide Scala fixes, but uh, don't make choices based on the existence of Scala fix, uh, I guess is what I'm trying to say there. All right, so, just to make you regret sitting through the whole talk, here's the takeaway in one slide. Um, I'm saying tech debt accumulates even from the outside, uh, whether you, you create it or not. Uh, ignoring it creates tech debt, tech debt downstream. Fixing it creates tech debt downstream. Uh, you can minimize this by being mindful about the changes you make, uh, and don't underestimate the scale of network effects. Uh, yeah, and that's, that's it. Thanks so much for, for coming. <laughs>